Welcome to the Friday edition of Florence World. And today I'm going to talk about freedom, but not in a general sense. I'm going to talk about it in the specific sense of people saying, well, it's a free country and therefore I can fill in the bank. Uh, and in this particular climate with the coronavirus spreading, causing COVID-19, and public health officials saying that you can flatten the curve of outbreaks if you do certain things, one of them being wearing a surgical mask in public, particularly if you can't social distance, that is if you can't stay more than two meters away from other people because the mask will not necessarily prevent you from catching the virus, but if you have the virus, it can help stop spread from you to other people through um, expired breath, droplets, and so forth. And of course, in the United States right now, if you've paid any attention to the news, you'll see that there is a raft of people, particularly in the southern states of Florida and Texas, saying, it's a free country, you can't make me wear a mask. Well, I beg to differ. So we can first of all talk about the concept of a free country. Now that normally refers to freedom of speech. Uh, typically countries that are not free don't allow the citizens to say publicly things against the government in particular. And the United States has a First Amendment to the Constitution that says that the rights of speech shall not be abrogated by the government. So right there and then, you've already got a limitation. It's not saying that speech is just free in general. It's saying that the government can't step in when it comes to, for example, newspapers. Um, but you're not free to say anything you want. Um, there are slander and libel laws. Slander is spoken language and libel is written language. And you can't just say what you feel like, either because it's injurious to other people. Well, now, if it's injurious to other people, but it's true, then you cannot be sued for slander or libel. But if you say something false about somebody, then you may be subject to slander and libel laws, although there are certain conditions. For example, it has to be proven that you knew that the information was false that you were spreading and you were doing it maliciously and the plaintiff has to demonstrate 
there was demonstrable injury caused by the remarks. There are lots of things like that. But also the famous case of you know, not being um, free to just yell fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire, because that's dangerous. Um, there are also laws against certain kinds of obscenity and all kinds of things. So free speech does not mean free to just say anything that's on your mind. And these have been litigated very seriously for over 200 years. But when it comes to actions, you also have to understand, of course you're not free to do anything you want. There are all kinds of laws. You can't cheat people, you can't steal, you can't murder, you know, you're not free to do that. Um, so, what about public health? Now, that's a very interesting issue. And we can start with the very famous typhoid Mary. <laughs> uh, you probably know uh, the name. Uh, you may not know that she was actually called uh, Mary Malone. She was from Ireland, an immigrant into New York in the very early part of the 20th century. And she worked as a household cook. In fact, she worked for seven different families. And the problem with Mary Malone was that she was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Like, so she didn't have it. She didn't even have the smallest symptoms of typhoid, but she was carrying it. And she gave it, we know, to f at least 51 people, and three of those people died. And she was arrested at one point when epidemiologists finally figured out, okay, she is the cause, you know, because she would work at one place and people would go down with typhoid and then she'd work at another place and people would go down with typhoid. Eventually, they figured out she is the carrier, although they didn't fully understand asymptomatic carriers at that point. But they figured out that it was her and they locked her up and she was furious, <laughs> you know, because she, she just thought it was harassment. You couldn't understand why uh, she c just couldn't continue as a cook because she, she felt perfectly healthy. And in fact, she um, managed to get away from her first uh, confinement, uh, but refused to st just stop cooking. She kept cooking, and so eventually they, they arrested her and quarantined her for the rest of her life for public health reasons. Now, a hundred years later, we'd probably do something rather different, and we would be able to explain to her better what the problem was, that the doctors really couldn't fully explain why they were quarantining her. But now we understand, and we understand when it comes to the coronavirus, that people can be asymptomatic, either for long periods of time before they become sick, or they may never become sick, but they are still carriers of the coronavirus. And that leads to public health concerns. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm interested in the ways that cultures have responded to this particular pandemic. And I'm very grateful to be living in Cambodia at the time now, uh, and I was at the time of the first outbreak. And I watched what happened in China. China's an extremely authoritarian country, and they just put lockdown 
procedures in place. They mandated the wearing of masks for people going out in public. They closed all public facilities, shops, everything. Uh, you couldn't even buy groceries unless you made an appointment. You got a, uh, a barcode on your cell phone, which you then took to the, uh, let's say, the grocery store or pharmacy. There are various uh, essential shops that remained semi-open. And so you make your appointment, you get your barcode, you go at the time that you're given, uh, and you present the barcode, and they also take your temperature. You cannot leave your house without a mask on, and you cannot enter a shop without the mask on. Your temperature's taken if it's normal, and you've got a mask on, you're allowed in for a limited amount of time. You have to keep two meters apart from anybody else in the shop. You have to pay in a contactless way, and so on and so forth. That's China. China knows how to like, enforce regulations like that. And Cambodia is the same way. Um, we're extremely fortunate here because the government, once it found out that the, uh, the virus was coming in from China, uh, stopped flights coming in. And then when it started spreading to Europe and to the United States and so forth, just cut off flights and just said, oh, sorry, you're not coming in. And the few flights that could come in carried only Cambodian nationals because nobody else could get a visa. So we have had, I think right now, I don't remember exactly, but I believe we've had about 130 confirmed cases in the entire country and no deaths and everything is pretty good. Uh, South Korea, not quite as authoritarian, but close enough. Japan, various other countries in Asia were able to put sensible public health regulations in place and people obeyed them. <laughs> now that's the part that I'm trying to get at here. It, for example, in Japan, it didn't take a regulation to say that people wear a mask in public. Now, it's true that a lot of people in Japan normally don't wear masks, but an awful lot do, and have done as long as I can remember. Um, the first time I was in Japan was about um, 15, 16 years ago and the vast majority of people on the subway or on buses or commuting were wearing masks. In Cambodia, I would say that when I first came here three years ago, uh, about one third of people that I saw in public wore masks. Now it's more like 90%. And I'm similarly inclined. I used not to wear a mask typically, but I used to wear one when I rode my bicycle. But the thing is, I, r I wore one when I ride my rode my bicycle because of air pollution. In Japan, people on the subway and buses, etc., typically wear masks because they don't want to spread things that they have. They're socially conscious about other people. They may not necessarily have symptoms of flu or cold or whatever, but they know that if everyone wears a mask, then everyone is protected. And that's Asia. You know, here, uh, like China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Korea, whatever. We've been wearing masks for decades. But then you turn to the United States, where nobody wears a mask, where 
if you're lucky, somebody sneezes on the bus and they cover their mouth and nose. Uh, but asking people to wear masks is a brand new thing. And I understand that. But what you've got is this enormous pushback from people, some of it completely loony. I mean, <laughs> I've been watching some of these um, public discussions where they're saying that masks are symbols of the devil. And what's certainly happening is a divide between people leaning towards Democrats or the left who wear the mask and people leaning towards the Republicans or the right who don't wear the mask. And President Trump is the poster boy of the right saying, well, I guess you maybe should wear a mask, but I'm not going to. So if the leader says, I'm not going to, that means all of his followers feel empowered to say, well, I'm not going to either. So here's where the issue of freedom becomes a moral issue. Is it free, is it a free country to just say to people in an emergency, in a health crisis, well, do what you want? Freedom is not really equatable with do what you want. You see, here we have a conflict between individual interests and social interests. And it's interesting to me because this is also the conflict between what I can label simplistically as the left wing of politics and the right wing of politics. That is that the left wing is more interested in the social good and the right wing is more interested in individual good. And I say simplistically because it's obviously much more complicated than that. And in the case of the United States, we cannot say that the Republicans are the right wing and the Democrats are the left wing. We can certainly say that the Republicans are right wing but we can't really say that the Democrats are the left wing because people like Joe Biden are somewhat centrist, leaning towards the right. But there is a progressive movement beginning in the Democratic Party that is pushing it more towards the left wing. But for the moment, let's just think about individual rights versus social needs. And the issue that is coming to the front right now is the issue of which side, if you will, wins. And the simple answer is that if the right wing side no masks, no protection, in individual freedoms wins, then also COVID-19 wins. <laughs> it's not complicated. And this comes to something that I want to talk about more in future videos, which is the somewhat schizophrenic qualities of the United States in general. So I am not singling out the United States as somehow odd in its split personality. All cultures have divides. That's not the issue. The issue is where the dividing line is. And in the United States, the clear dividing line is between individualism and social needs. And it's been around for a very long time. 
as long as the nation has existed. And it manifests itself in the political sphere all the time. And the country goes one way sometimes and the other way at other times. That's standard anthropological stuff. I'll talk about that more in future videos. Not sure if I'm going to get to it next week. Uh, probably on Tuesday I'm going to go back to cooking. Not entirely sure, but that's uh, where the smart money is. And then Friday I'll do some more uh, rambling about something or other. So tell your friends if you like my videos. Please subscribe, and I will see you on Tuesday.